Once born into a little town by a riverside, a kid was created. Insatiably curious and outstanding with his gift with words, he was known to be one of the best storytellers the world had ever seen. He grew up on the fireside of fables and confidences, and through the day and night he would write and create stories which he would tell to the world to delight and intrigue. He would, undoubtedly, leave his footprint on the earth for years to come, and from humble beginnings would rise a legendary bard whose name would become permanently engraved on history books themselves, known as William Shakespeare. Now, William had a quote that in particular is very well received and revisited up until this day, and that quote is, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. This very quote, in my mind, solves the exact problem that many people find themselves running into when playing character archetypes like the ones that we discuss today. Specifically, we're talking about the Chosen One. You were the Chosen One! It was said that you would destroy this and not join them! I hate you! I loved you! the bane of DMs everywhere, the very epitome of main character syndrome. But I'm gonna be honest, I think there's a lot to do with this type of archetype, if you know what you're doing. So let's talk about it. There we go, we got through the intro. We've succeeded at least in that part. Honestly, I feel like it's pretty clear why this character archetype is an issue to play in most TTRPGs, but just in case some might still be curious, it makes it way too easy to try and be the main character of the story that is not meant to have a main character. See, TTRPGs, if you're playing them like most people do, means that you're sitting at a table with a bunch of other people, and the chosen one typically is the person which the story revolves around, which flies in the face of what you would most likely expect from a TTRPG, which is where everybody is playing their part to be the protagonist of the story. So if you have one person of which the whole story revolves around, well, the whole concept begins to fall apart if that's the case, doesn't it? If what you're chosen for is too important, whether it be a prophecy or whether it be something that a god has deemed you must do, etc., etc., it then makes the plot less relevant for everybody else. There's no reason for the rest of the party to try and, well, find any amount of intrigue with the story that's happening. Vice versa, if it's all about you, but everybody else is doing their own thing, suddenly your chosenness becomes far less relevant. Like, yeah, maybe you were chosen to go on a quest, but that's not what everybody else is doing. That's not what the story's about. And if there are four people at the table and three of them are pulling in one way and you're pulling in another, either you're going to feel isolated or the party's gonna split, which, you know, is the one thing that you don't do in TTRPGs. That's rule number one. Obviously, this archetype runs into a lot of issues. With that being said, a lot of people like this archetype. There are so many classic stories about chosen individuals. People who had prophecies told about them, people who had a specific goal they needed to achieve, or people who had greatness thrust upon them, as mentioned earlier. But that also leads to a lack of agency as well. See, if you're somebody who already destined this for your character, it can be really easy to feel like your character has no choice. Especially if the DM was the one to make it seem like you were the chosen one, and that wasn't something that you personally had any intention for. Player agency is super important. That is something that you need to focus on. So with all these things in place, it seems like the chosen archetype is just something that you shouldn't play in TTRPGs, right? Well, anybody who's watched my channel for long enough knows that I believe every archetype can be played properly should you do it correctly and keep proper things in mind. So how do you do that? Well, I did mention that quote at the beginning of the video, and I honestly feel like it solves the exact problem many people find themselves running into. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some people have greatness thrust upon them. This quote fundamentally, at least in my eyes, defines what it is to be chosen. Sometimes being chosen means that you had greatness or something that was a part of you from the beginning. Sometimes it means you are prepared to achieve greatness throughout overcoming adversities and struggles. And sometimes it means that in order to survive, you must become something great. But either way, being chosen doesn't mean the story is about what you will eventually accomplish. It's about what your character goes through in order to come to terms with being chosen for a great task. So you gotta ask yourself several questions. One, does your character accept your fate? This is, without a doubt, the most crucial and interesting question you can ask when dealing with any amount of 
fate or prophecy or destiny or any of the above because the main thing that defines us as creatures is the fact that we have free will. So something that seems to take away our free will is an interesting path to go down. And it doesn't have to be a path where you just insist that you must have your free will and that this removes it from you. What if you're a character who accepts their destiny, fully believes that this is something they're going to achieve to the point of lunacy? What if it gets to the point where you are willing to, at any cost, achieve this fate? You go into a battle where it is very possible that you'll die. In fact, it's almost certain, but you don't take that seriously because you're fated one day to do this thing. So. You can't die here, right? So on, so on, so on. There are a lot of different ways to address the question of do you accept your fate? But the very question, do you accept your fate? Is one of the most interesting parts of the story that this trope and archetype typically will tell. But then you also have to ask yourself, what kind of fate is it? There are so many different options out there. Are you fated to kill a specific enemy? Well, that would be really interesting if your character was a pacifist. See Aang from The Last Airbender. See, he didn't want to kill Ozai at the end. And also, you know, spoilers for The Last Airbender, but The Last Airbender that I'm talking about is the cartoon and not the movie by M. Night Shyamalan and also not the series, which has recently come out, which tells the same story, but a different story and also hasn't gotten to that part yet. Did you just spoil Avatar? I know. The blue show? I, I'm taking psychic damage right now. <laughs> Who directs that, James Cameron? Yeah. James Cameron, get an original idea for once. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll bring up the hate comments. That's, yeah. Uh, film bros, get in the comments. Anyways, spoilers for The Last Airbender. Skip to this time code if you don't want any. But the whole point of the story is that Aang must kill Fire Lord Ozai by the end of the series. It is what everything's leading up to. Previously on Avatar. Everyone, even my own past lives, are expecting me to end someone's life. <laughs> You're weak, just like the rest of your people. Revenge, die! However, he's a pacifist. He doesn't want to kill anybody. A pacifist being in quotation marks. If you actually go look through the series, he killed a lot of people. And I've only had to use violence for necessary defense. And I've certainly never used it to take a life. Man, such a bitch <laughs> Oh! But that's not the point of what I'm trying to make. He didn't want to kill Ozai. So the type of fate that is put there creates a different story based on what it is. Is it you going to kill somebody? Is it you must achieve something? Is it that you're doomed to make a great mistake? Any of the above makes it a far more fascinating type of scenario. But it really requires you to work very heavily with your dungeon master. The third question you have to ask yourself is how does your character's reaction to this fate interact with the other characters. And this leads to that problem that I mentioned at the very beginning of the story in the first place, which is, doesn't this archetype inherently take the spotlight away from the rest of the player characters? Isn't that the antithesis of why we play these games? But no, I mean, it's interesting and it certainly does put a large amount of the story spotlight on you. But the best thing about the spotlight is the moment that you're in it, it gives you the power to bring others in and share it. The moment the spotlight's on you, you have the ability to direct where it shines just by walking. That's kind of how it works, assuming you have a decent spotlight operator. Oh, look! It's the good fairy! She'll know what to do. Not to fear, little children. I will help. So that being said, asking yourself, how do the other characters interact with your fate is interesting. When you ask yourself, what do the other characters think about your fate? Do they believe in fate? Do they support the fate that you're supposed to do? Do they support your destiny or do they go against it? All of those questions are fascinating to ask. This character archetype does not remove you from being the main character if you're not, wait, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. This archetype does not prevent you from participating in everybody else's stories. It does not make you or force you to be the main character. So long as you understand that having a destiny does not mean that everything must focus on you because everybody else should have just as much of an input on that destiny as you do. Katara, Sokka, Zuko, Toph, all of the above all had some amount of input on Aang's destiny and were very important to the story, despite the fact that they were not supposed to be the ones to have the ultimate final confrontation. And so too is the same here. Not only that, again, this is a TTRPG. When you get to the BBEG, you're all gonna fight him together. And if you're all fighting them together, that means that more than likely your destiny is going to be faced down with this group of individuals. 
So it is inherently something that encourages everybody to be involved, so long as you don't feel like it must always focus on you. Yes, you might be the one driving the plot forward in the same way that Frodo does when he takes the ring and takes it upon himself and makes it his destiny to take it to Mount Doom. But in doing so, so many other people were involved, so many other people were in the spotlight, and in the end, Frodo was not the one to make it to the top of the mountain. Yes, he held the ring, but Samwise was the one to carry him. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you! Come on! It doesn't have to be just you. Just because your character is fated to do something does not mean that your fate is not intertwined with everybody else's in the party. In the moment that your character realizes that, the moment this archetype becomes so interesting. So not only did you spoil fucking Avatar. Oh, I spoiled Lord of the Rings too. Yeah, what the fuck? Do you know how many times I've spoiled Lord of the Rings on this channel? I, if I was willing to go rewatch my own videos, I would put a count up right now of how many times I've spoiled Lord of the Rings. It's just atrocious that you're doing this. Yeah, it's really atrocious. I put a spoiler warning earlier and I didn't even put the score. So, when you realize that the end goal, whatever important world saving thing your character is supposed to do or won't do is not about just you, but instead the story it causes, suddenly each and every character becomes much more important. Most stories with the chosen one could not happen and would not resonate without all of the characters everywhere else. All characters with a great destiny and goal thrust upon them that only they could accomplish always have other individuals surrounding them that help them become the person they needed to to accomplish the goal in the first place. And yes, they need to accomplish that goal. The story was about how the others helped them grow to make that happen. Truthfully, the beginning of this video outlined this archetype as being the main character. But chosen ones are best used as supporting roles and catalysts. Supporting roles meaning that they provide a reason for everybody else to do something, a direction for everybody else to go, and they work as a catalyst to help everybody, well, honestly just merge together as a group because there's a common goal they must go towards and figure out. They also help the chosen one grow. And yes, again, this does sound a little bit main character-y. If everybody's focused on helping the chosen one grow, it begins to get too focused on them. But so many times in these stories, do things happen? that the chosen one is simply not even involved with. Everybody else gets to have their own experiences. Everybody else gets to have their own things. Everybody else gets to have another avatar spoiler here, sorry. Their own magical journey with Zuko. Everyone else went on a life-changing field trip with Zuko. Now it's my turn. I know you had a rough childhood, but we should really focus on finding Aang. This is the worst field trip ever. You just have to understand that just because your story might be one of the main points, it is certainly not the most important story happening at the table. Because the most important story is all of you. But honestly, I think the one thing that I haven't mentioned that is the most important is that all of this relies on the Dungeon Master. And to Dungeon Masters out there who have a character who wants to play this type of archetype, or sorry, a player who wants to play this type of archetype, don't let that happen without caution. Speak with the player. Understand why they want to play the archetype. Because if they want to play it because they want to feel important, there are better ways to go about that that won't make the rest of the table resent them. But if they want to play this archetype because they want to explore the idea of a character with such a heavy weight on them, that is another story. Anytime a player approaches a DM with a specific type of archetype they'd like to play, it is important for the DM to understand not just what, not just how, but the why. Because the why will help you avoid issues in the future. Every player character, every player just wants to feel like they were able to participate in the story. And as soon as you understand the why, the rest can simply follow. That is, I think, how you play a chosen one. Or you could simply do the opposite and try and put somebody who has a really important destiny and they end up dying at level three and that entire plot there gets dropped in the first place and you don't hear about it till the end of the campaign. Also totally an option. So go out into the world, make it your own, and uh, never forget to play a role and listen to my wife as she gives the call to action. Wife? Uh, like, comment, subscribe, mm -hmm. and all the film bros get the comments and tell Jay how he's ruined all of film. I, I, I was the death of film. Bye! <laughs> Bye!